uh, giving a slot to speak here. It's always a pleasure to be back in Santa Cruz. I've been, you know, coming several times now, uh, not as long as Andy, but uh, uh, I'm going to do my best to present something new. So I decided um, uh, I want to talk about galaxy spin shapes and, um, and what the impact of subgrid models is. And uh, first of all, let me thank my collaborators, which are listed here. Um, it's the Horizon AGN simulation coll collaboration. Uh, uh, and uh, the people in uh, both face here are uh, basically people that did most of the work. Sandrine Codis and Elisa, um, that's, that's, that just finished her PhD, is going to defend a PhD in September. Elisa Shizari and uh, Mark Richardson, who are, who are postdoc in Oxford. All right, so the outline of my talk is going to be as follows. Well, first, I want you to realize that the most important physical quantity that we use to define galaxies is actually a vector. It's the angular momentum, all right? So, um, and I'm going to talk of the angular momentum as a vector here, not just the, you know, the amount of angular momentum, the, the amplitude of it. So, as you've seen in many talks already, uh, this is, so there, you know, this leads to complications of how galaxies actually acquire their angular momentum, and, and they're linked to uh, dark matter only simulations, all right? So, essentially, I'll show you why uh, dark matter simulations are not enough. So, if dark matter only simulations are not enough, what, what are we going to do about it, okay? <laughs> So, right. So this this will lead me to tell you about uh, um, measuring intrinsic alignments of spins and shapes in cosmological hydrodynamics simulations. The problem that you encounter when you try to do that, due to the li limitations of the simulations, and then I'll conclude by even more pleasant considerations, meaning how the measurements that you are doing in this already uh, low resolution simulations are affected by the subgrid modeling that you have when you go to higher resolution. Okay, so essentially uh, I would claim that there's a consensus, as you've heard uh, many times, that the angular momentum actually comes from the large scale filaments and mergers, which I will call nurture, and then I'll try to, um, to, try to quantify how this uh, how the way it is redistributed on small scale, on small galaxy and subgalaxy scales, actually matter for predicting spin uh, and shapes of galaxies. That's that's what I'd call nature. Okay. And then uh, uh, all this, I'm going to try to do in a framework that's relevant for observations. Uh, meaning, I'm going to tell you what why you should care about being able to make that prediction uh, in terms of of uh, I'll, I'll discuss mainly in terms of weak lensing. Uh, and the measurement of cosmic shear. All right, so angular momentum carried by streams. This is work, um, this is work we did uh, quite a while ago now with Christophe Pichon, uh, Dimitri Pogosian, Tyson Kim, and uh, Adrian Sliz. Uh, essentially, the cartoon, uh, the cartoon is as follows in 2D. Uh, essentially, you have, um, um, you have two um, asymmetric, adjacent asymmetric voids that are expanding. Uh, at the interface between them, they create a filament uh, where the filaments intersect at the nodes you've got halos. And since these voids are asymmetric, they have a slightly different velocity. You get a low transverse velocity on the filament, and as matter is advected towards the halo, you bring in this velocity uh, and you bring in this angular momentum. Okay? Uh, you can s visualize this very uh, nicely with, uh, 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 with uh, dark matter only simulations here which shows you um, a filament that's high redshift here, and it shows you a filament. So what you will see from these pictures is that you have like a, some kind of a skeleton that actually persists. That's what Christophe called the sweeping skeleton. Here, the color, color, dark color is high redshift, low redshift. And what you see is that these filaments on large scales are extremely persistent. So um, they're bringing in the stuff uh, coherently. All right? So I want to just go to through two results uh, from this paper. First of all, in this paper, we actually show that the uh, accreted momentum, at the uh, specific angular momentum at the variable radius of these halos is actually, um, uh, is actually increasing with mass and time. And second of all, uh, which is more relevant for what I'm going to say now, is that this is, um, this is basically accreted coherently. You see the more wider project projection of the density map here. These dots are the large scale structure filaments. And these are two more wider project projections of this for the same halo at different redshift. And what you see is what 
it was illustrated in sweeping skeletons, these things are about in the same place. They don't really move. We quantify that by measuring the, the angle between the angular momentum of the stuff they bring between two different redshifts, and you got a result here, probability distribution function of this, uh, the cosine of this angle. And what you see is that uh, there is a huge peak, so in different colors give you, uh, give, give you different redshift intervals. And what you see is that there is a huge peak around one, which, which means that there is hardly any change in, uh, in the angular momentum vector. Okay? Um, let me just digress a little bit and tell you of a work that Clotilde did um, a, couple, a year ago, uh, because it's gonna be relevant for what I'm gonna show next. Uh, which is she actually measured uh, the vorticity of these large-scale filaments, right? So that's what, we, what you see. You see a, 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 a filament, a large-scale filament in one of these cosmological simulations, and she's put a plane, a cross-section perpendicular uh, to, uh, to the filament, and what you see clearly is this quadrupolar structure um, here, okay? And so basically, this all goes to a prediction of uh, Christophe and, and, and Francis Bernardo in 99, which show that the vorticity of this filament is actually generated during shell crossing. All right? So she went on and measured the property, this properties in the simulation. So you see that essentially she found, she measured the number of multi-flow regions in these caustics, um, and then she found a strong peak at four, which leads to say that the caustic are quadrupolar. Okay? And they have a finite size. Okay, why is this relevant to what I want to say? Uh, is because we went ahead and uh, in 2012 in the Horizon 4-5 simulation, which was the largest simulation, pure dark matter simulation done at the time with more than 70 billion particles, we actually measure uh, the, um, um, the, basically the, the angle between the, the spin of the dark matter halos in the simulation and the direction of the filament. Okay, and what we found was a mass transition, as you can see in this plot. So it's the same thing. It's the, uh, it's the one over the, the probability uh, function uh, as a function of the cosine of the angle. And what you see, these different colors, now this is for redshift zero, and these different colors are all different masses. So it's not monotonous, but what you see is that um, um, basically at some point, uh, the low mass objects are preferentially aligned or misaligned, you know, we don't make the difference here. Uh, and then at some point, so there's a mass transition around uh, 12, you know, 3, 10 to the 12 or so, where this thing flips, and then uh, galaxy, uh, halos uh, become more perpendicular to the filaments, okay? And so what was puzzling in this measurement uh, was why the transition mass is not the transition mass of the pressure mass function, um, uh, but it's much smaller, right? Uh, yes. No, 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 no. It's not the m star of the of the projective mass function. This is redshift zero stuff. So the m star uh, of the is is a as much larger mass than uh, than three times ten to the twelve. No, no, it's not. We can, we'll go. We'll we'll talk about it offline. And so what we uh, um, what we figured out is that this um, this mass function, this uh, characteristic mass transition, is basically related to the to the, vorticity, to the size of the vorticity quadrant that I showed you before. In the sense that, um, and so that, uh, um, so Sandrine just put out a paper where she, where she actually showed that this, uh, in order to understand what, why that is, how this arises, is that the, um, uh, you need to do, uh, to go a step further in the tidal talk theory and go to an isotropic tidal talk theory where, um, where you actually see the uh, calculate how things work um, at the, in the saddle regions in the vicinity of filaments. Okay, so as for the dark matter, of course, uh, what observers measures are galaxies, so we repeated this measurement in the Horizon NGN simulation, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, so this is a paper by uh, Johan Dubois et al. And lo and behold, we found kind of, um, of the same effect. So basically, uh, that's the probability distribution function of the cosine angle. And what we found is that the spins of our galaxies, of low mass galaxies, so here it's split into, a, into V over sigma uh, bins, um, so ellipticals with low V over sigma uh, and, and disks with a, a high V over sigma. Our disk were preferentially aligned, the spin of our disk were preferentially aligned with the filaments, whereas 
uh, for the uh, elliptical galaxies that was preferentially that were preferentially perpendicular. And this was actually the uh, so uh, mind you, this is not a very strong signal, but this was actually also, uh, also detected um, in the uh, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey by by Temple and Libeskind. Right. So here is so they use slightly different notation. I'll 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 come back to this notation here. Their their E three vector is the filament axis essentially, and what you see is the is the same thing. Right. The elliptical galaxies are per, uh, preferentially across theta, which is perpendicular to the filament, whereas um, the spiral for the spiral galaxies preferentially aligned with cos theta equals one. All right. Um, uh, then in a, in a later paper, we actually showed that the spin swings that, that actually lead to this misalignment are actually due to mergers. Um, essentially, uh, Charlotte Walker measured the number of the number of, so she brought the merging tree for all the galaxies in the simulation, um, uh, in the Horizon AGN simulations, and looked at the ones that had mergers. So here, NM is the number of mergers, and, you'll, and, and these two guys are, uh, are the ones with no mergers, and what you what you see is that um, essentially um, the mergers are driving the, uh, the perpendicular um, thing. Okay, so that's all for one point statistics. But uh, you know, if we're going to go into the weak lensing domain, you're going to need to do two point statistics. So we went back to the simulation. I want to show you uh, before I go into this this two point statistics and in the relevance for weak lensing, I'm going to show you the Horizon AGN simulation. So um, it's this website here if you're interested. So that's the characteristic. So essentially it's a, it's a simulation that's, uh, that's similar to uh, in characteristics to the illustrious and eagle simulation that you've heard about but done with Ramses. Okay. Um, let me show you a movie of how it, uh, how it works if I can. Yeah. All right. So it's the stunt. So this so essentially you, you see the redshift going here and the the scale here, and so um, uh, green is the density, red is the uh, is the temperature, and blue is the metallicity, and you see the time evolution here of this. And then we're going to zoom in into a slice, but that's just to give you an idea of uh, uh, of one of the main advantages why you would go to this uh, cosmological volumes is basically every little tiny dots that you see here, the green dots, is a galaxy. So that's a zoom in. 10 times, and so you get, a, you get an incredible sample of galaxies, and if you're going to do uh, weak lensing uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, and you, you're going to need to, you're not going to need this, uh, the statistics to actually extract a signal uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, which is statistically meaningful. All right, um, let me pass this. So, this being said, what are the weaknesses of the simulation? Well, the current spatial resolution is about a kiloparsec, so you don't resolve basically any galaxies, right? especially the scale high. All right? So you're not going to do any galaxy formation physics with the simulations, as we've heard already from Joel this morning. Um, uh, one thing that, uh, that I like to point out that's not really appreciated is that, it, with, you know, contrary to observations, where, when, when you don't have the resolution, you're just simply smoothing out reality. Uh, in simulations, when you don't have a resolution, you actually miss physical processes as well. All right, so you're not just smoothing, okay? And so, and the other thing that I like to point out is that you have to be careful of convergent studies, right? Because generally, the subgrid models that you use in the simulations actually depend on resolution. And I'll show the, I'll show you that um, in the final part of my talk. So why bother? Well, essentially, you gain things by going to these large scale simulations. You better model the gas flows on large scales, right? And the interaction of the outflows that you predict are coming from the, your semi-analytic model boxes that are your galaxies uh, with, with these in, inflows, okay? Uh, this is all self-consistently coupled. But for what I'm interested in, um, it's very important to use because you get a better description of the large-scale structure of the, of the environment and of the interaction with, uh, with, the, with other galaxies, of the galaxy mergers, okay, in an explicit cosmological context. So that's very important for the clustering properties, the spin and the shape, okay? And of course you get the large statistical sample that I needed for weak lensing. All right, I'm going to have to skip a few things uh, because I'm running out of time. Essentially, to characterize the uh, environmental galaxies, we're using a, a, a tool built by Thierry Sous B, which I encourage you to, uh, it's, a, it's uh, publicly available, it's called Disperse, that detects filaments 
uh, in simulations, but also in observations, have been used in, from the interstellar medium to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's a very powerful tool to characterize filaments as ridges. Um, we can talk about this offline if you want. The other thing that I want to mention is that uh, we've all heard about the importance of the AGN feedback in the simulation. So we have exactly the twin of Horizon AGN, which we call the Horizon No AGN, which has exactly identical except that it has no AGN feedback. All right, and that allows us to um, to actually uh, compare, um, you know, really tell what what is due to AGN feedback in the simulations and what is not. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over that and just say that uh, an important point for, uh, my, uh, for what I'm going to talk about, about shape and sizes of uh, the, the morphology of galaxies, is that AGN feedback here uh, changes. Um, it's not that it, it sets the size of the galaxies, but it changes the morphology of the galaxy. Here is the, um, it, our galaxies, the mass is increasing that way in the no AGN simulation, and here are the same galaxies in the AGN simulation. And what you see is that the sizes actually change, but also the morphology. And it's not that the AGNs are actually setting the, the, the size, they just prevent reaccretion of gas onto these galaxies. So um, basically the mergers set in the morphology and then the, the AGNs for massive galaxies take over and prevent them from changing morphology again. This is demonstrated in a paper that I don't have the time to discuss uh, by Charlotte Welker. All right, let me talk about the cosmic shear alignment. Essentially, what we want to use the simulation for is to predict the, um, uh, to, to, to basically predict what the values of the terms that actually pollute the cosmic shear measurements. All right, so essentially what you observe is you observe correlations between uh, projected ellipticities in the observations, and these are a combination of what we call the II term for intrinsic alignment, so the intrinsic ellipticities of your galaxies, okay, and a GI term which is uh, basically the cross-correlation between the cosmic shear and the intrinsic ellipticity. And what you want to measure is the correlation, the, the correlation of the cosmic shear. So you want to, ideally, you want to model these out of, of your observations to attract the cosmic shear. Let me go a little bit into the, into the details, but not too much. Uh, essentially, uh, what is the GI term? I'm, I'm going to give you a view with the spin and the shape is, uh, I'm going to talk about the shape later, but uh, um, Essentially, it's easier to understand with a, with a spin. So essentially, gamma, what a gamma the cosmic shear is, is the traceless part of the Haitian of the gravitational potential projected, okay? And so if you, uh, if you uh, um, call lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, the eigenvalues of this uh, thing, and the eigenvectors e1, e2, e3, what you can measure is you can measure the, uh, whether the, the eigendirections are correlated with the spins. And so cos theta is now the dot product of, of the vector by the spin of the galaxy. And essentially this E1 thing is this thing that uh, in the Temple and Limbuskin paper uh, is called E3, but uh, so it's actually, you see a map of it here, it's parallel to, uh, to the filaments, okay? And so what you measure here are going to be, so the one point statistics of the alignment that I've talked about is this, and what we want to measure is actually the correlation of of the spin of the galaxy with this E vectors as a function of distance. That's the two-point statistics that we actually want to measure here. Okay? For the uh, same thing from the uh, II term, the intrinsic alignment, now it's the correlation between the spins of the two galaxies as a function of distance. And you can go, um, it's all explained in this paper, you can make a simple model for going from the spin to the shape um, if you wish but you can also directly measure the shape in the simulation, and that's what Elisa Chisari has been doing uh, at Oxford. So she, uh, the shape is defined with the initial uh, inertia tensor, so, so she measures that on the stellar particles of our galaxies. And essentially, uh, this shows you, we, you know, how well it converges. Um, um, and, um, and basically, um, um, let me skip that and give you the end product of that. Here I'm talking about the GI term, so the, the cosmic shear versus ellipticity. Essentially, that's, that's our main result. Uh, so here is, is the correlation function as a function of distance. What you see is that uh, ellipticals actually point towards elliptical. That's the split into, uh, into V over sigma. Is always the black one is the ellipticals. Uh, um, and the blue ones are the spirals. And what you see is that the spirals seem to be or, uh, or randomly oriental, uh, oriented around uh, other spirals and ellipticals point towards elliptical. And 
Look at the scales here. Correlations actually persist on large scales. This is, uh, this is 10 megaparsec here, right? Okay, um, so that's, uh, that's 3D. So essentially what it means, uh, so you can do the same, uh, measure the ellipticity direction correlation, and you've, you see that spirals are oriented tangentially around elliptical preferentially. Um, and that, of course, well, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about spin here. Uh, and so, and that ellipticals are elongated in the direction of the spiral, so what you, do, what you get in the end is a cartoon like this, all right, where you have the ellipticals here and the spirals in blue oriented, okay? So, of course, this is all um, a 3D, but we want to mimic observations, so we actually projected uh, this on the sky and actually measured as a function of stellar mass, dynamics uh, of the galaxy, and color, because that's what is measured, uh, in the observations, and what we find is that we find a, sig a signal that is in good agreement with what is measured um, uh, by, um, um, uh, what's this paper, that's uh, <coughs> Jing and, uh, yeah, that's this paper, Kumora and Jing. All right, uh, let me uh, tell you why I didn't, in very briefly, what I talked about preferentially, the GI signal and the, the intrinsic alignment signal is that we figured, we, we found that uh, we had a, uh, uh, we basically had a grid locking contamination for the spin spin, and I'll come back to that. So in the sense that we have a signal where we see nothing for the ellipticals and something for the, some alignment signal for the spirals, but we're not sure, we're not convinced that this signal is not due to numerical effects. Uh, and I can talk that more offline. And now let me just briefly <coughs> flash one result because I have no time of the, uh, what I was going to uh, mention next is how does this depend on subgrid model? So um, basically, uh, we run several subgrid models with different feedback, different style formation, and this and looked at how this alters the shape. This altered the, our conclusions. How this changes the. Uh, so I'm going to just focus on this plot. I guess this is the specific angular momentum for the same galaxy, and the hatch regions are. Um, are basically our six different models with six different subgrid physics. So changing the star formation uh, relation or, or changing the feedback. <coughs> and what you see is that for the gas, um, uh, the, uh, these changes are, are, can, be, can be really consequent even, even in the amplitude of the angular momentum. And here are the orientation by the <coughs> defined by two different directions. And um, this can vary depending on what you're doing uh, on up to 40 or 50 degrees in the gas, but much less in the stars and dark matter. Uh, essentially, I have no time for that. Um, and so um, uh, what I would like to point out that even though the spin directions actually uh, change out, change quite a lot depending on the resolution <coughs> and on the subgrid model, um, what seems to be more robust, weirdly enough, is the shape. Um, and here is, um, is uh, an illustration of that, but uh, once again, uh, uh, very little time to uh, discuss this, but uh, happy to uh, take questions on this. Uh, essentially what happens is that if you compare the, two, the different simulations, you modify the shape of the galaxy slightly, but you don't, uh, so you, you, for instance, feedback and puff up the disk, uh, but since this, uh, these quantities are then projected on the sky, the changes in the, uh, in the ellipticity of the galaxy is going to be much, much less than the, the change in the, in the direction of the, of the spin. And let me just finish this here and put up my conclusions. That's you're referring to this, All right? Yep. There is no if. Well, so. Well, so here is this is the intrinsic alignment uh, term, right? So essentially, it's it measures if you wish the uh, uh, the angle between or between the shapes of the elliptical as a function of distance. 
And what we see is that this angle seems to be uncorrelated, at least at, at this redshift. What yeah. about the pink effect? I'm surprised that that's not what you see. Correlation. Well, so what, it, what, no. Sense. Uh, what, is, what is seen is that, and there you see, well, let me go back to the, uh, to the 3D picture. And here you have a, right, so you have to, if you look at the ellipticity direction correlation now, then there is a big signal for the, uh, for the elliptical, right? How can this not give rise to the correlation? It doesn't. So that's why, I, once again, that's why I didn't show you any intrinsic uh, alignment signal because here we have to, as I said, we have to. It only makes sense if the key itself has a very small correlation. Scale, or they were very large scale. No, yeah, that's right. So here, what we have the problem for the intrinsic alignment signal is that we have a grid locking. We know we have a grid locking problem, right? In the sense that. The problem with this, uh, with this AMR simulations is that when you don't resolve the scale height of the disk, then basically when your disk collapses to form stars, you preferentially align the disk with, uh, with the direction of the grid. Right? And so that we, we have shown in this paper by Cesare, I'll, I, I encourage you to read the paper and then we can talk about it. We've shown this does not uh, affect the previous, the GI, the GI part of the signal. But it does affect the II part of the signal, and it's very, very hard to actually measure it and subtract it out. So this can be interpreted as a, as a physical result or not, or it could, it could be purely numerical. And so I, I encourage you to read, as especially the impendence of the paper. To, we've, we've done a bunch of tests because we, we were puzzled, but that's what we find. So yeah, so, so here, here's a more wider projection. So here what you have is the, uh, is, is the, is the spin. So you see clearly the, the, the spins are, are collated with the, with the direction of the grid. But on the bottom what you have is the, uh, is the, is the distance vector. And the distance vector is not, does not show these correlations. Right? And that's why when galaxies are close by, uh, you have a, and you're looking at, at Intrinsic correlations, you you have a problem, but when you're doing doing that as a function of distance, or along random pos, uh, positions, then it works. I, it's it's all explained in the paper, but we, we, you know I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to discuss it with you. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, the pieces out there. So.